Translator's Preface to the Phenomenology of Mind, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Phenomenology of Mind, Volume 1, by George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel. Translated by James Black Bailey. Translator's Preface. The work here translated and offered to the English philosophical reader has long been recognised as a unique product of Teutonic genius, and as, on the whole, perhaps the most remarkable treatise in the history of modern philosophy. Alike in its style of thinking, its manner of expression, the comprehensiveness and its of its survey, and the wealth of its material, it can hardly be said to have a parallel. Tracts of experience, which have each formed from time to time the subject of separate discussion, have engaged the undivided interest of different thinkers, and are here treated as but fragments of a single system. Movements of human history, which have marked epochs in the development of the human race, are looked on as but typical or prominent embodiments of principles at work in the spirit of man, and are discussed in shadowy schematic form, through which the historical reality is referred to is only dimly visible. Acknowledged truths of science are stripped of their apparent self-containedness and independence, and are reduced to phases of the necessary movement of human intelligence. The supreme importance assigned by mankind to religion are not allowed to obscure the fact that religion is but one act in the drama of spiritual existence. Even to the work of philosophy there is assigned but a relative though necessary place. Man in his lifetime must needs play many parts, and one of these is to be a philosopher, and all philosophies are here regarded as but phases of a single mood. The imposing array of philosophical positions constituting the history of philosophy are abbreviated into a central principle which together evolve a single comprehensive truth, controlling the minds of individual philosophers, though all unknown to themselves. So exhaustive an analysis of the life history of the human spirit, so sustained an effort to reduce its complex and involved harmonies to their simple elemental leading motives, and to express these controlling ideas in an orderly connected system, has certainly never been compressed within the compass of a single treatise. The courage which made such an effort possible was no doubt in large measure due to the state of the intellectual atmosphere at the time when the book was being written, an atmosphere surcharged with a grand and grandiose ideas which were capable of stimulating and sustaining philosophical enthusiasm, or of exciting and intoxicating speculative ambition. Inspired by the promise and potency of the Kantian philosophy, Kant's immediate successors made bold to set sail on speculative seas unknown, with a fraction of their master's scientific knowledge, and none of his philosophical prudence. Influenced in Hegel as Hegel undoubtedly was by the confident daring of these earlier intellectual adventurers, it was not long before a mind so concrete as his, and with so reverent a regard for scientific truth and practical fact, saw the necessity for chaining speculative imagination to the solid ground of tried and verifiable experience. It might be possible to dispense with the things in themselves, but it was not possible to dispense with the things. If the new philosophy was to make any claim to a connected system of ideas, appealing to old and satisfying the common reason of mankind, the wealth of familiar and accessible truth in science, history and ordinary experience must be at our disposal before philosophy can take with assurance the high road of comprehensive systematic knowledge. The constant if cryptic reference throughout the whole of the following treatise to facts of nature, human nature and human history amply testifies at any rate to the seriousness with which Hegel endeavoured to meet the demand of all true philosophy. In this sense the work before us in large measure is a reaction against the soaring insubstantiality of the ingenious manipulation of principles in abstracto and the wearisome and methodical constructions of the works which intervened between the Kantian analysis of experience and the appearance of the phenomenology in 1807. It is therefore small surprise that, though the appearance of the book was hailed with great expectation, the work was received with coldness and dissatisfaction by those who had, up to this point, been Hegel's teachers and friends. But while an enormous wealth of representative material lies behind the treatise, partly illuminating the argument, partly determining the course of its development, it need not be supposed that the author could possibly lay claim to omniscience. From first to last it is apparent that the author was limited by the information available at his time, by the scientific views prevalent during his day, and by his own selective interest in the material presented before him. Only in one department was his knowledge sufficiently adequate to reduce this limitation to a negligible characteristic, this was in the department of history, and more especially the history of philosophy. 
material it may well be said the material was regarded as primarily representative and typical of movements of the human spirit so that errors of fact or detail for the purpose of this treatise are insignificant even so the selection of such material is governed both by his interest in the problem of the phenomenology and also by the intellectual attitude and bias of the time a selection under conditions imposes restrictions on the character of the argument of the treatise such limitations as those indicated are doubtless inevitable and they help us explain many of the more singular peculiarities or even obvious defects of the work subjects are treated in this book with a fullness and even diffuseness of analysis which must now seem utterly out of proportion to the value of what is discussed for example hegel devotes much labour to demonstrating the hollow pretentiousness of the pseudo sciences of phrenology and physiognomy and endeavours to bring to light the truth which they had misconstrued the explanation is that in his day these twin scientific impostures had great success and won much favour from learned and unlearned alike the scientific function of observation again is dealt with at inordinate length doubtless because of the success which attended the scientific investigation of nature towards the end of the eighteenth century so too is the constantly recurring reference to states of spiritual life which were familiar features of the romantic movement is only to be explained by the outstanding historical importance of this movement at the time the book was written but the omissions from the treatise are as remarkable as the exaggerated attention devoted to some aspects of experience and relatively to others in a work ostensibly dealing with the whole range of human experience it seems surprising to find no specific discussion of our knowledge of space or of number or of the sphere of fact dealt with by chemistry or again to take another domain of experience remote from these there is no mention at all of the fine arts like music or painting such omissions are all the more striking and we bear in mind hegel's cleaner, keen appreciation of the value of both pure science and fine art and when we remember that in his later works a full and elaborate treatment is given to the subjects mentioned it is not enough to plead in excuse that he is dealing in this work with the main types of experience and that what is not explicitly discussed is implied in the analysis of the type selected for it seems obvious that the kinds of knowledge of art and above referred to play a unique part in experience and are not simply specific forms of more general types of experience looking at the plan of the treatise as a whole and the method of treatment assigned to the forms of experience brought under review an impartial critic is bound to admit that the scheme of work is unbalanced and out of proportion the discussion of some parts is foreshortened and in other cases subjects are treated with an elaborateness of detail in which the main idea is overborne by the sheer mass of the material used to elucidate it at times indeed the writer seems to have become so absorbed with the particular subject in hand that for the time being he seems to have lost sight of the plan and purpose of the argument of the whole treatise in such cases the author's description of his work as a voyage of discovery has a little literalness of application which is more accurate than complementary to the author the business of a writer is to determine the chart of his argument before he sets out in this literary expedition and not to draw it afterwards in order to discover what coasts of truth he has visited hegel himself felt that in many parts the argument had been overweighted and expressed the hope in a letter to his friend neithammer that he might be able to in a second edition load some of the ballast and get the ship to float more easily the last part of this work is especially unsatisfactory to the discussion of religion and absolute knowledge one would naturally have expected the author to have devoted the greatest care and the best of his energies for it was one of the main objects of his task to explain and justify the place of philosophical knowledge in the plan of human experience yet the analysis of religion is condensed fragmentary inadequate to the theme while the statement of absolute knowledge is brief and elliptical to the verge of obscurity this is disappointing more particularly after the long and carefully wrought argument dealing with the sphere of moral and social experience which immediately precedes the section on religion defects certainly demand some explanation and it is to be found in the circumstances under which the last part of the treatise was written in a letter to schelling in which hegel promises to send him a copy of the book hegel asks indulgence for the unsatisfactory character of the last parts of the work and says as if by way of explanation that the composition of the book was concluded at midnight before the battle of jena this sounds a little hollow and melodramatic one naturally asks what the roar of napoleon's cannons had to do with the philosophical delineation of the absolute the absolute as well as his expositor could surely afford to wait until the smoke of such temporalities had cleared in any case on the night before the battle there could have been no serious cannonade to dis disturb hadel's meditation in point of fact the prussian general himself did not expect that napoleon to attack on the fourteenth day of october the day of the battle and it is extremely unlikely that hegel could have been so certain of napoleon's plans as to feel constrained to hurry in the completion of his book in case of eventualities no doubt after the battle affairs in jena were uncomfortable and sufficiently uncertain to induce hegel to carry about in his pocket the manuscript finished on the night of the thirteenth and to defer till the 
20th, when things had quietened down, the dispatch of his manuscript to Bamberg. The real explanation was much more commonplace. Hegel had made an unfortunate arrangement with his publisher. Instead of waiting till the manuscript of the work was actually finished before sending it to the publisher, Hegel arranged to let the publisher have it in instalments. The publisher was to pay so much a sheet. The first payment was to be made when half the entire manuscript was in his hands. Printing began in February 1806. Any publisher could easily have made sure of getting the best of such a bargain. In this case, the publisher was a printer, publisher and bookseller all in one, a singularly dangerous position for an impecunious man of letters to deal with. When Hegel had sent what he took to be half the manuscript of the book and demanded payment accordingly, the publisher declared it himself unable to feel satisfied that this really was half of the manuscript. Payment was therefore refused, and further the edition of 1,000 copies originally agreed upon was altered now to one of 750, with the corresponding diminution of payment to the author. Hegel, being much in need of the money, appealed in despair to his friend Neithammer, then living in Bamberg, the place of publication, and asked his good offices to urge the publisher to forward the money. The publisher was obdurate. Finally, Neithammer made a new contract with the publisher, where by Neithammer agreed to pay the publisher so much should Hegel fail to send the last of the manuscript by the 18th of October 1806. The new contract was made on the 29th of September. By great effort, Hegel managed to send off a large instalment on the 8th and 10th of October, promising faithfully to send the last remaining instalment by the 13th. Meantime, Napoleon appeared on the scene, and hostilities with Prussia were definitely declared from Bamberg on the 7th of October. The proximity of this Veltche on the horseback added to Hegel's anxieties and difficulties, for there could be no certainty that the postal arrangements would be efficiently carried out and the manuscript safely reach its destination, either in due time or at all. Hegel was in agony for the loss of time would be serious to his friend and the loss of the manuscript irreparable to himself. It was in these circumstances that the last part of the phenomenology was composed. With his mental energies strained to keep pace with the flight of time, his personal honour at stake with the roll of war in his ears and a pitiless publisher master of his financial resources, even Hegel could hardly be expected to be in the appropriate frame of mind necessary to compose the dialectical hymn of absolute knowledge. There is thus some excuse, and at any rate sufficient explanation for the curtailed analysis, the hurried argument, the condensed utterance which characterise the last stages of the work, but the result as it now appears must be taken as it stands. Valuable as it is, it is not a fully elaborated development of one of the richest and most important parts of the whole range of experience. It is not an ample and measured survey of the domain of the absolute, it is speculative steeplechasing. But these deficits, avoidable and unavoidable, to which reference has been made, do not seriously impair the monumental greatness of the work. No man can escape from the limitations of his own individuality any more than he can avoid the restrictions imposed on him by the circumstances of his time. The very attempt to rise above them requires the assistance to support the effort. We cannot therefore expect that the work before us, which, as we shall see, is so closely concerned with history, should be unaffected by the conditions under which the historical phenomena exist. The translator has endeavoured throughout the book to indicate the train of thought connecting the successive stages in the analysis. It will suffice here to indicate the general character and purpose of the work and to draw out the main thread. In general terms, the phenomenology of mind is a comprehensive and systematic survey of the ways in which experience appears. This explains the meaning of the term phenomenology, a term employed by Lambert in his work The New Organon, 1764, and later by Kant, who uses the word to cover the metaphysical interpretation of the idea of motion, which forms the concluding section of his Metaphysical Foundations of Natural Science, 1786. The survey seeks to accomplish threefold results. Number one, to show the various forms of experience constitute a continuous and connected series of stages of the mind, that life of mind as a whole is thus a single continuous movement. Two, to vindicate for each typical form of experience a necessary place in the plan of the whole. Three, to prove that the self-comprehension of spirit absolute knowledge is the necessary demand the inevitable outcome and the final consummation of the entire process of experience these three aspects of the argument essentially involve one another without some single principle present throughout the series of forms they could not be connected together spirit in this principle without some single end dominating the movement from first to last the movement could not be continuous absolute knowledge is this end unless each stage has a definitive positive value of its own, no connection could be established between them. The moments of experience would be illusory and the experience as a whole meaningless, a series of negations which would not even be a series and certainly could not give us a system of truth. The source of this positive significance of each step is again absolute knowledge, and finally and less absolute knowledge of the outcome of the whole process, either there would be no absolute at all and the process would be endless and so unintelligible, or else the absolute would simply appear as shot out of a pistol 
and hence would itself be unintelligible the process of experience is necessary to the meaning of the absolute as the absolute is necessary to give meaning to the process there seems no reason to doubt that all three aspects of this result were present in the author's mind before he proceeded to work on the argument in the treatise this seems obvious in itself and a perusal of his introduction conclusively shows this to have been the case the ways in which he varies the description of the character of the treatise arising from laying emphasis on one or other of the features of the argument the term phenomenology of mind has in view the fact that we are here dealing with the procession of the nodes of mind and the form in which this experience appears the term sciences of experience of consciousness by which he describes it on the title page of the first edition a designated omitted apparently by hegel and his editors in the subsequent edition lays stress on the second aspect above noted the constructive interpretation of the positive value of each phase of experience the development of science or again the development of the natural consciousness up to the level of science by which he designates the work refers to the relation of movement of experience to its final outcome and end a relation in virtue of which he also speaks of the work as the first part of a system of science and an introduction to a speculative science in general to interpret experience in the manner above indicated it is necessary to find at the outset a conception of experience which will apply both to the experience as a whole and to every form the experience appears the term experience is indefinite and hence has been used by different thinkers and for different purposes accepting the result of kant's analysis hegel regards experience as constituted by an interrelation of subject and object the interrelation takes the form of conscious awareness of an object the movements are distinct and the unity of these factors is simply the mental process holding them together in a single mental situation and distinguishing them from each other within that state the moments are inseparable and have neither existence nor significance except in conscious relation to the other till the distinction arises there is no experience after it has disappears there is equally no experience kant held that the relation disappeared if a particular kind of object a sense object disappeared or could not be produced from this followed his things of view per se apart from experience and of ideas of reason beyond the bounds of experience both notions are connected together accepting temporary criticism of kant hegel rejected both notions and hence rejected kant's restriction of experience the sense phenomena the subject object relation was still maintained as the essential nature of experience but whereas in virtue of the above restriction kant admitted a subject object relation to hold where there was no experience for example in the sphere of reason hegel extended the term experience to each and every conscious relation of subject and object in this way hegel was in closer touch with the fact of common usage and carried to it to its legitimate conclusion as a fruitful principle established by kant this extension of kant's principle both removed its limitations and deepened its meaning what kant meant by insisting that sense objects were necessary for experience was that in all experience there must be a given or immediate element but kant identified the given or immediate with sense objects here no doubt givenness must seem very prominent and very obvious this givenness which is so obviously a feature of sense facts is however largely due to the striking mental contrast between thought and sense in truth the immediate is found in many other forms besides that of sensibility and on kant's own showing even the givenness of sense involves an operation of the subject before entering experience kant confounds the immediacy which is essential to the relation of subject and object with a particular kind of immediacy found in a particular kind of relation of subject of to object viz sense experience or consciousness of sense objects in other words he identified a formal character of all experience with a peculiar content of one kind of experience hegel saw that the very nature of conscious relation of a subject and object implied the subject and object were in all cases immediately related to one another but this is only the first step in the relationship the formal condition of there being a relationship at all the relation is not static it is a process or conscious movement in the constitution of which two terms are distinct and distinguishable factors the movement being simply the process of uniting the two in a single and complete mental situation this process as contrasted with immediacy is described as the condition of mediation it is essential to the total state of immediacy and in the nature of the case is absolutely inseparable from immediacy kant had been at pains to establish the necessity of such a mediating process in the constitution of experience but had again interpreted this in a one-sided way for kant the mediation was introduced in the form of an intellectual operation of manipulating the material of sense which somehow the mind appropriated externally just as there was one kind of immediacy that of sense so there was only one kind of mediation that of understanding the error in the interpretation of the former has its counterpart in the interpretation of the latter the correction of the error takes the same line in both cases since immediacy is only one way in which the immediacy appears 
in the general relation of subject and object. Intellectual mediation through understanding is but one of the many ways in which the mediation of subject through object and object through subject take place. There are in short many forms of mediation as there are forms of immediacy, for both are required and found in every possible relation of subject and object. But the transformation of Kant's result is not yet complete. Another step is required, equally necessary and equally important. Immediacy and mediation are formal conditions of every possible relation of subject and object, but the form is inseparable from, and in every case relative to, its content. This principle, the full significance of which Hegel seems to have found through the study of Aristotle, was indirectly confirmed by the very confusions and ambiguities which characterised Kant's attempt to keep them apart in his three critiques. The concrete embodiment of the principle was typically represented first of all in the fact of having a living organism, and more clearly still in the actual process of the moral life of man. The reality of the principle in those two spheres indicated to Hegel, as to Aristotle, how the principle was to be interpreted in other spheres. Kant's doctrine of the primacy of practical reason now received a new and supremely important meaning. The moral life provided the clue to the solution of the relation of matter and form in experience as a whole and in every experience of every kind. For there, the essential union of man's rational activity with nature was the very condition of the experience, and yet the form and the matter of the experience were, as Kant had held, distinct. If, as Kant maintained, the reason at work in moral experience was one and the same with the reason which operated in knowledge, then the reason which was practically, i.e. actually, established as an operative principle of unity of subject and object in morality must be equally the operative principle of the unity of subject and object in knowledge. If, as Hegel interpreted, the position self-conscious reason or spirit actually controlled and permeated the entire range of its material, nature, the moral life, where the separation of subject and object was greatest, and the union of the two the very purpose of their relation, then in this experience we have at once a supreme manifestation of the principle of the unity of form and content, and a key to interpret all other ways in which the unity may appear in experience. Thus then we get the fundamental features of experience with which the phenomenology starts. Experience, wherever it is found, is constituted by 1. Subject and object, 2. An immediate conscious relation, 3. Mediating that relation in a process of reciprocal involution, the one with the other, 4. Within the limits and under the control of an underlying unity or universal, which 5. Is implicitly or explicitly determined by self conscious reason or spirit. We next ask how are the forms of experience to be found, whose experience is under consideration, what determines the selection of the types to be considered. The answer lies in the nature of the system which the treatise seeks to furnish, the system of experience as a logical and historical ap aspect. On the one hand, it seeks to be a coherently ordered body of truth, as such it must work with universals, for the coherence which every scientific system requires can only be obtained by connecting universals. On the other hand, its facts are the manifestation in time of the content and processes of conscious individual experiences. As such, they are historical phenomena, for history is precisely the coexistence and succession in time of the appearances of living individuality. But it is transparent that this system of experience does not appear qua system, for historical experience is a discontinuous disarray of events and occurrences. It is equally clear that every individual does not as a fact take on, either successively or otherwise, each and all of the forms which the human spirit historically assumes. For the purposes of a system of experience, we want therefore to combine these two aspects in a single working conception. The science requires generality, the experience requires individuality. The generality of science must be individualised, the individuality of experience must be generalised. The generality of science is satisfied if it is allowed to abstract a form of experience from a given historical or individual situation, and treat this form as a typical moment of experience. The individuality of experience is satisfied if at any time or any individual situation the typical form can be, as has been, actually realised. Both are satisfied at once if the experience is considered by the system is treated by the experience of a generalised individual. This series of forms of experience, analysed and connected in the phenomenology, constitute the experience of such a typified individual. This working conception enables us to treat experience as a whole and at the same time to embrace the various modes of experience that appear discreetly in history. Without it, we should either have mere history, which is inexhaustible and so cannot be a whole, or mere connection of abstract ideas, which cannot be as such an experience. This typified individual is no doubt another expression for the Kantian conception of consciousness in general, and in any case the idea of such 
an individual is directly analogous to what we find in any science which seeks to deal with living individuality no physiologist supposes that what he says of the functional operations of an individual organism will be found precisely to hold of any chance individual whom he may examine at a moment's notice for the chance individual may happen at the time to be below the level of normal health or may have had his organic functions affected by an endless variety of circumstances prejudicial or otherwise yet the physiologist does not consider that these variations make a science of the functions of the organism impossible he deals with averages the average individual is the basis of his science in a similar way the generalized individual is the working basis for the construction of the system of experience such a conception determines the principle on which the forms of experience are selected and the manner in which the historical phenomena are treated in the argument those selected are in the main the constant or recurring forms of experience we do not find every possible form of experience discussed but only the forms that serve the main idea of the discussion idiosyncrasy and eccentricity are no doubt of interest in human experience but they have a significance or purpose of biography or autobiography they are off the main track of common experience and do not play a necessary part in the development of the essential substance of human spirit nor do we find all the forms of experience that might have been expected to have a place in a general plan of experience the restriction in the selection of these forms of experience is largely accounted for by the limitations on which the author worked again historical phenomena are throughout the argument inevitably treated as individual circumstances of a type of experience not as mere historical fact this accounts for one of the most perplexing difficulties in the following discussion at certain points concrete historical facts are before the mind of the author inspiring and suggesting the course of his analysis but hardly a single hint is given of the particular facts in question it would seem as if history is treated as a mere illustrative footnote to a typical movement or experience instead of being as it is the substance of the movement analysed the particular time at which the historical facts appear is a matter of indifference to the type of experience still more to the thousand and one details which fitted them into one historical epoch as distinct from another hence at some stages of the argument currents of history similar to or identical in character but far removed in point of time may operate simultaneously determining the nature of the discussion and elements may be drawn now from one and now from another regardless of historicity the reason for, and the justification for such a procedure is that while history may not repeat itself types of experience do as we see for example from the simple facts of language custom and tradition and indeed it may be said that only when a form of experience has been repeatedly inscribed on time's palimpsest so as to produce a composite impression are we in a position to regard it as a type and thus an essential factor in the unfolding of complete meaning of human existence that type and historical fact should thus be indissolubly blended is the argument of the phenomenology a necessary characteristic and condition of such a system of experience whether the author has successfully interwoven the two in his analysis may well be questioned it may be said that sometimes he mistakes a side track for the high road sometimes he takes an incident for a type sometimes he takes aspects of a type for the whole sometimes he repeats types at different stages of the development of the whole but at any rate there need be no doubt regarding his intention and aim the last general question of importance concerns the nature of the method of constructing such a system this is determined by what has already been said the method in a word is that of development there was nothing novel in such a method it has been used with success by aristotle and in modern philosophy by Leibniz. the application of it for the construction of a system of experience has been suggested even attempted by schelling in his transcendental idealism eighteen hundred where he sought to exhibit all parts of philosophy in a continuous succession of stages or epochs in the history of self-consciousness what was new in hegel's use of the method was due to the clearness of his conception of what he meant by development and the rigorous inflexible persistence with which he sought to work it out in his view the principle of the method is involved in the very nature of every type of experience as well as the whole of experience for the method is neither more nor less than the operation of the form of experience itself and the form of experience as we have seen is inseparable from the content indeed it may be said that the presence of the method is a test of whether or not any apparent case of experience is or is not typical and worthy of consideration the general character of the method is that of the unification of opposites by a process which reveals their inherent necessity to one another in virtue of their participation in a common principle and conversely the specific procedure of the method is that one starting from a prima facie or immediate relation of the terms opposed as subject and object two showing how they mutually involve and determine or mediate one another and thereby three evolving between the inner unity of the principle 
which both establishes and contains their immediate relation and makes possible and necessary their mediation the procedure is one and the same in its operation in every type of experience and in experience as a whole for one and the same principle controls and pervades all experience viz self-conscious reason or spirit and the various types of experience are to the whole of experience as the factors in a given experience subject and object are to the type in question the same method thus spontaneously determines the various chief divisions of the whole argument and the particular stages in the evolution of the meaning of a given type of experience the author fully explains in his preface and introduction the significance of the various phases of method and his statements need not be repeated here enough has been said to indicate the general nature of the method as applied throughout but while the system is constructed deliberately by this method it need not be supposed that the successful use of the method was an unique and mysterious secret of the author of the treatise who carried out his scheme in the private laboratory of his own mind without suggestion or assistance from any other source whatsoever as a matter of fact the author's claim that his own particular inspiration is quite unnecessary and is even irrelevant and so far from dispensing with assistance in the construction of the argument he maintains that his method really operates through though unconsciously in all minds and in all experience and there can be no doubt that in the working out of the method the author was guided to a very large extent by results achieved by others and by facts and suggestions drawn from familiar sources for one thing it's clear that before commencing his argument he must have had a definite idea of where his argument was likely to terminate as of the stage of experience from which it was to begin and it is not difficult to trace the profound influence of greek thought in determining the analysis of both the beginning and the conclusion of his system of experience the discussion of sense certainty in the first stage of the phenomenology seems little more than the fresh restatement of the analysis and criticism found in greek philosophy especially in plato and aristotle the conception of absolute knowledge with which the phenomenology concludes is a reproduction of aristotle's interpretation of pure thought Quote, pure thought thinks that which is the most divine and most precious and it does not change since it is the most excellent thing it thinks itself and is thinking is the thinking on thinking in productive activity apart from the matter the substance or formal essence is the object and the theoretical activity of the object is the concept or function of thinking therefore thought and the object of thought not being different in the cases where there is no matter will be the same and thinking will be one with the object of thought as human thought holds as in a certain period of time so the divine thought the thought which thinks itself holds throughout all eternity unquote again the order in which the various forms of experience are placed between the upper and lower limits of experience was also suggested to a large extent by the mental development of the individual and the historical development of mankind this was inevitable for the very nature of experience as we have seen involves processes in time and this occurs in a definite order if that order coincides with the necessary order required by a logically constructed system the coincidence may be a chance but it facilitates and gives vividness to the analysis moreover it is of the essence of the argument to look upon historical processes whether individual unit or in a larger area of spiritual life found in society as the condition by which the particular and universal elements of experience become concretely identified and harmonized thus for example the psychological process of mental development provides the suggestion for the dialectical process of mind from sense knowledge to perception or again from consciousness to self-consciousness the historical evolution of the greek and roman society suggests the dialectical transition from the custom constituted to the law constituted order of society the historical connection between the individualism of the eighteenth century and the ethical philosophy of kant and fichte suggests the dialectical connection between the atomistic freedom of a revolutionary epoch and the inner freedom of conscience such then is the principle and method of this philosophy of experience when systematically developed every essential mode of experience must find its due position and validity guaranteed for the guarantee of the value of every form is the ultimate transparent unity of subject and object in absolute knowledge and every essential form is required as a stage in the realization of this spiritual idea the only truth about the whole of experience is thus the comprehensive system of all the forms in which the truth is attained throughout experience every essential form makes its own peculiar contribution and none can be absolutely false for an absolutely false relation of a subject and object is either meaningless or a contradiction in terms we may describe the system as a critique of experience but only in the sense that such a criticism 
is the self-criticism of experience, for beyond experience we cannot possibly find anything, still less a standard to criticise experience. We cannot arbitrarily break up experience into separate parts and elaborate independently a critique of knowledge, a critique of morality and a critique of beauty, for all of these are but forms of one experience. Experience is the common denominator of them all and must be construed as a whole. In short, a true critique of experience can only be a connected system of the whole of experience. It is manifest that such a system is no more than an orderly arrangement of the ways in which experience appears. It does not expound all the truth that the various modes of experience themselves contain. Each mode forms a nucleus of a sphere of truth all its own, and the elaboration of which is a separate undertaking by itself. The substance of the truth which each contains is only relevant to the argument, and is only introduced so far as it is necessary to bring out the peculiar nature of the kind of experience each mode embodies. Again, the phenomenology is distinct from empirical psychology on the one hand, and the concrete life of the individual experience on the other. The growth of mental life of the distinction between subject and object is presupposed before experience can be said to exist, and the growth of that distinction in time is part of the work of the psychology to trace. On the other hand, relatively to the living agent in concrete experience, the phenomenological observer is like the historian or the dramatist who perceives and understands the play of forces controlling the living agent, and traces the connection of the moving principles that operate unseen and certainly unforeseen in the production of their result. It is equally clear from what has been said that the phenomenology is not a complete system of philosophy. It is, at the most part, and, the author has insisted, the introductory part to a comprehensive philosophical system. The exhaustive elaboration of absolute knowledge would alone be a complete system of philosophy. All that is done in the phenomenology towards such a system is to show that absolute knowledge is a mode of spiritual life and has its roots in experience and is the consummation and final cause of the whole process of experience. The author endeavoured in his other works to construct the entire system of absolute knowledge but the success or incompleteness of this achievement does not affect the value of the argument in phenomenology which justifies the standpoint of absolute knowledge. But though the phenomenology is not a complete system of philosophical knowledge, it is itself a philosophical systemization of the modes of experience, for only a philosophical argument could justify the validity of the philosophical point of view, and this Hegel does by showing that every mode of experience in the long run derives its validity as an avenue to the truth from the fact that it implies the essential principle of philosophical knowledge. The argument of the phenomenology is undertaken to prove that the interests of all forms of knowledge are bound up with the validity of philosophical knowledge. The phenomenology enables us to determine the position of absolute truth, and the parallax of the absolute can only be found if we take as our baseline the diameter of the orbit of human experience. It is not necessary here, even if it were in place, to defend the argument of the phenomenology from possible lines of attack and criticism. Least of all, need it be asserted that we have in this work the last word of philosophy regarding the nature and meaning of experience. The discussions of philosophy are not to be reduced to the level of a brawl in a marketplace, and no serious philosopher ever made a merit of having had the last word. But so much may be said. If in principle, aim and result, the argument of this work is untenable, idealism, whether as a creed or as a system, may once and for all be abandoned. Indeed, any attempt to put a spiritual interpretation on the facts of human life. In a sense, the present work contains little that is new beyond the method by which the forms of experience are wrought into a connected system. In a manner, it is but an elaborate exposition of the doctrine expressed in the well-known lines, how exquisitely the individual mind and the progressive powers, perhaps no less, of the whole species to the external world is fitted, and how exquisitely too. The external world is fitted to the mind. Words with preface to the excursion. That experience must, in the long run, obtain its explanation and justification from itself may be regarded as a truism, and, again, that the absolute embodies itself in all modes of experience, as it requires every form of truth to constitute the whole truth, and only in the entire extent of our human experience can we read the full meaning of the absolute spirit in which we live and move and have our being, these are propositions acceptable in every age and recurring as regularly as the days of the human calendar. We might even say, in the words of the unsophisticated child of nature, Ungfar sagt, dass der Pfarrer auch nur mit ein bisschen anderen Worten from Faust. But the familiarity of much of the substance under discussion will not lessen the value of the argument in the eyes of those to whom a comprehensive conspectus of experience is an intellectual need. That they will find both light and leading in this remarkable book there can be no doubt. To these the book may be safely commended, and those whose need is greatest will find the most. The best edition of the text is that of George Lassen, pastor of St. Bartholomew's Church in Berlin. This appeared in 1907 and is a most carefully collated recension of the work.
The translator was fortunate in being able to make use of this edition in the final revision of the translation, which was begun long before Lattinson's edition appeared. Another competent student of Hegel, Professor Bolland of Leyden, has also produced an edition of his work in 1907, but this is merely a reproduction of the second edition of 1843, beautifully printed on beautiful paper. All the footnotes accompanying the text in the, of the translation have been appended by the translator. For some of these he is indebted to editions of Lanson and Bolland. The editions of 1807 and 1843, Hegel's work too, contain no notes. In addition to the footnotes, the translator has also written short introductory paragraphs for most of the sections and subsections to, in, to which the work is divided. These paragraphs will be found in small type within brackets. They are intended partly to be explicatory and partly to be a guide to the argument, partly to indicate the background of historical fact to which the analysis refers. In default to a full and commentary, which it is hoped may some day appear, these paragraphs may be found useful to the student of the book. In translating the work there has been no attempt to do more than give a rendering of the original which would be faithful to the meaning and as close to the style of the text as was consistent with clearness and intelligibility. There seems no doubt that the work was written with less regard than usual to literary effect and with more regard to the logical coherence of the result than is common in works in philosophy. The appalling struggle of the author to carry out his self-imposed task of arranging the crass material of experience into an organically connected plan of necessary thought and of satisfying his demands for philosophical system overwhelm all other considerations whatsoever. It is impossible, as it is unfair, to expect anyone who is staggering under the weight of absolute truth to move to the graceful measures of literary minuet. He is content to let his meaning be expressed in a way that comes readiest to his hand and offer the least impediment to the movement of his thought. The consequence is that the style throughout of the work is severely formal and is only relieved at times by the crudest and homeliest metaphors. It is no part of a translator's task to improve his author and when the thought of the original is clad in wincy, then it is not the translator's business to drape it in satin. The translator is therefore refrained in the present case from attempting to make the reproduction more attractive from the literary point of view than the original. He can only hope it will not be found to be less so. In the task of revising and correcting the proofs, the translator has been placed under deep obligations to those who have kindly assisted him with suggestions and criticisms. The whole of the proof has been read by the general editor for the series, Professor Muirhead, and by Mr. McLeaver, lecturer in philosophy. Aberdeen University. George Lassen, pastor in Berlin, has also given invaluable help with the translation. The early part of the translation has been greatly improved by the suggestions of Professor Pringle Patterson of Edinburgh. Whatever merit the translation of the middle portion of the work may possess is in large measure due to the careful criticism of Mr. Jockham of Merton College, Oxford. The right Honourable Mr. Haldane M.P. has read proof of considerable part of the work, and the translator is also indebted to Miss Haldane for criticisms in one of the most difficult sections of the argument. King's College, Aberdeen, March 1910. End of the translator's preface. Recording by Morris in Arsley, Bedfordshire. Preface to The Phenomenology of Mind, Volume 1 by George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel. Translated by James Black Bailey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Preface, Part 1. In the case of a philosophical work, it seems not only superfluous, but in view of the nature of the subject, even inappropriate and inexpedient, to begin, as writers usually do, with a preface explaining the end the author had in mind, the circumstances which gave rise to the work, and the relation which the writer takes it to stand to other treatises on the same subject, written by his predecessors or his contemporaries. For whatever it might be suitable to state about philosophy in a preface, say, an historical sketch of the main drift and points of view, the general content and results, a string of desultory assertions and assurances about truth, this cannot be accepted as the form and manner in which to expound philosophical truth. Moreover, because philosophy has its being essentially in the element of universality, which encloses the particular within it, the end or final result seems, in the case of philosophy, more in that of the other sciences to have absolutely expressed the complete fact itself in its very nature, for which the mere process of bringing it to light would seem, properly speaking, to have no essential significance. On the other hand, in the general idea of, for example, anatomy, the knowledge of the parts of the body regarded as lifeless, we are quite sure we do not possess the objective concrete fact the actual content of the science, but must, over and above, be concerned with particulars. Further, in the case of such a collection of items of knowledge, which has no real right to the name of science, any talk about purpose and such like generalities is not commonly very different in manner 
from the descriptive and superficial way in which the content of the science, these nerves and muscles, etc., are themselves spoken of. In philosophy, on the other hand, it would at once be felt incongruous were such a method made use of, and yet shown by philosophy itself to be incapable of grasping the truth. In the same way, too, by determining the relation which a philosophical work professes to have to other treatises on the same subject, an extraneous interest is introduced, and obscurity is thrown over the point at issue in the knowledge of truth. The more the ordinary mind takes the opposition between true and false to be fixed, the more it is accustomed to expect either agreement or contradiction with a given philosophical system, and only to see the one or the other in any explanation about such a system. It does not conceive the diversity of philosophical systems as the progressive evolution of truth, rather it seems only a contradiction in that variety. The bud disappears when the blossom breaks through, and we might say the former is refuted by the latter. In the same way, when the fruit comes, the blossom may be explained to be a false form of the plant's existence, for the fruit appears as its true nature in place of the blossom. These stages are not merely differentiated, they supplant one another as being incompatible with one another, but the ceaseless activity of their own inherent nature makes them at the same time moments of an organic unity, where they not merely do not contradict one another, but where one is as necessary as the other, and this equal necessity of all moments constitutes from the outset the life of the whole. But contradiction in the case of philosophical system is not usually conceived in this way, and again the mind perceiving the contradiction does not commonly know how to relieve it or to keep it free of one-sidedness, or to recognize, in what seems conflicting and inherently antagonistic, the presence of mutually necessary moments. The demand for such explanations, as also the attempt to satisfy the demand, very easily pass for the essential business philosophy has to undertake. Where would the inmost truth of a philosophical work be found better expressed than in the purposes and results? And in what way could these be more definitely known than through the distinction from what is produced during the same period by others working on the same field? If, however, such procedure is to pass for more than the beginning of knowledge, if it is to pass for actually knowing what a philosophical system is, then we must, in point of fact, look on it as a device for avoiding the real business at issue, an attempt to combine the appearance of being in earnest and taking trouble about the subject with an actual neglect of the subject altogether. For the real subject matter is not exhausted in its purpose, but in working the matter out, nor is it the mere result attained in the concrete whole itself, but the result along with the process of arriving at it. The purpose by itself is a lifeless universal, just as the general drift is a bare activity in a certain direction which is still without its concrete realization, and the naked result is the corpse of a system which has left its guiding tendency behind. Similarly, the distinctive difference of anything is rather the boundary, the limit of the subject. It is found at that point where the matter stops, or is what the matter is not. To trouble oneself in this fashion with the purpose and results, or again with the differences, the positions taken up and the judgments passed by one thinker and another is therefore an easier task than perhaps it seems. For instead of laying hold of the matter itself, a procedure of that kind is all the while away from the subject altogether. Instead of dwelling within it and becoming absorbed by it, knowledge of that sort is always grasping at something else. Such knowledge, instead of keeping to the subject matter and giving itself up to it, never gets away from itself. The easiest thing of all is to pass judgments on what has a solid and substantial content. It is more difficult to grasp it, and most of all difficult to do both together and produce the systematic exposition of it. The beginning of culture and the struggle to get out of the unbroken immediacy of naive psychical life has always to be made by acquiring knowledge of universal principles and points of view, by striving in the first instance to work up simply to the thought of the subject matter in general not forgetting at the same time to give reasons for supporting it or refuting it, to apprehend the concrete richness and fullness contained in its various determinate qualities, and to know how to furnish a coherent and orderly account of it, and a responsible judgment of it. This beginning of mental cultivation will, however, very soon make way to the earnestness of actual life in all its fullness, which leads to a living experience of the subject matter itself, and, when in addition conceptual thought strenuously penetrates to the very steps of its meaning, 
such knowledge and style of judgment will be relegated to their due place in everyday thought and conversation the systematic development of truth in scientific form can alone be the true shape in which truth exists to help to bring philosophy nearer to the form of science that goal where it can lay aside the name of love of knowledge and be actual knowledge that is what i have set before me the inner necessity that knowledge should be science lies in its very nature and the adequate and sufficient reason for this is simply and solely the systematic exposition of philosophy itself the external necessity however so far as this is apprehended in a universal way and apart from the accident of the personal element and the particular occasioning influences affecting the individual is the same as the internal it lies in the form and shape in which the process of time presents the existence of its moments to show that the time has come to raise philosophy to the level of scientific system would therefore be only the true justification of the attempts which aim at proving that philosophy must assume this character because the temporal process would thus bring out and lay bare the necessity of it nay more would at the same time be carrying out that very aim itself when we state the true form of truth to be its scientific character or what is the same thing when it is maintained that truth finds the medium of its existence in notions or conceptions alone i know that this seems to contradict an idea with all its consequences which makes great pretensions and has gained great widespread acceptance and conviction at the present time a word of explanation concerning this contradiction seems therefore not out of place even though at this stage it can amount to no more than a dogmatic assurance exactly like the view we are opposing if that is to say truth exists merely in what or rather exists merely as what is called at one time intuition at another time immediate knowledge of the absolute religion being not being the centre of divine love but the very being of this centre of the absolute itself from that point of view it is rather the opposite of the notional or conceptual form which would be required for systematic philosophical exposition the absolute would not be grasped in conceptual form but felt intuited it is not its conception but the feeling of it and the intuition of it that are to have the say and find expression if we consider the appearance of a claim like this in its more general setting and look at it from the level which the self-conscious mind at present occupies we shall find that self-consciousness has got beyond the substantial fullness of life which it used to carry on in the element of thought beyond this naive immediacy of belief beyond the satisfaction and security arising from the sense of certainty which conscious life possessed regarding its reconciliation with ultimate reality wherever present whether inner or outer self-conscious mind has not merely passed beyond that to the opposite extreme of insubstantial reflection of self into self but beyond this too it has not merely lost its essential and concrete life it is also conscious of this loss and of the transitory finitude characteristic of its content turning away from the husks it has to feed on and confessing that it lies in wickedness and sin it reviles itself for doing so and now desires from philosophy not so much to bring it to knowledge of what it is as to obtain once again through philosophy the restoration of that comfortably solid and substantial mode of existence it has lost philosophy is thus expected not so much to meet this want by opening it up in a compact solidity of substantial existence and bringing this to the light and level of self-consciousness it is not so much to get chaotic conscious life brought back to the orderly ways of thought and the simple unity of concept as to run together what thought has divided asunder suppress the notion with its distinctions and restore the feeling of existence what it wants from philosophy is not so much insight as edification the beautiful the holy the eternal religion love these are the bait required to awaken the desire to bite not the notion but ecstasy not the march of cold necessity in the subject matter but ferment and enthusiasm these are to be the ways by which the wealth of concrete substance is to be stored and spread out to view with this demand there goes the strenuous effort almost perfervidly zealous in its activity to rescue mankind from being sunken and what is sensuous vulgar and of fleeting importance to raise men's eyes to the stars as if men had quite forgotten the divine and were on the verge of finding satisfaction like worms in mud and water time was when man had heaven decked and fitted out with endless wealth of thoughts and pictures the significance of all that is lay in the thread 
of light by which it was attached to heaven. Instead of dwelling in the present, as it is here and now, the eye glided away over the present to the divine away, so to say to a present that lies beyond. The mind's gaze had to be directed under compulsion to what is earthly and kept fixed there, and it has needed for a long time to introduce that clearness which only celestial realities had into the crassness and confusion surrounding the sense of earth things earthly, and to make attention to the immediate present as such, which was called experience, of interest and value. Now we have apparently the need for the opposite of all this. Man's mind and interest are so deeply rooted in the earthly that we require a like power to get them raised above that level. His spirit shows such poverty of nature that it seems to long for the mere pitiful feeling of the divine in the abstract and to get refreshment from that, like a wanderer in the desert craving for a merest mouthful of water. By the little which this can thus satisfy the needs of the human spirit, we can measure the extent of its loss. The easy contentment in receiving or stinginess in giving does not suit the character of science. The man who only seeks edification, who wants to envelop in mist the manifold diversity of his earthly existence and thought, and craves after the vague enjoyment of this vague and indeterminate divinity, he may look where he likes to find this, he will easily find for himself the means to get something he can rave over and puff himself up with. But philosophy must be aware of the wish to be edifying. Still less must this kind of contentment, which holds science in contempt, take upon itself to claim that raving obscurantism of this sort is something higher than science. These apocalyptic utterances pretend to occupy the very centre and the deepest depths. They look askance at all definiteness and preciseness of meaning, and they deliberately hold back from the conceptual thinking and the constraining necessities of thought as being the sort of reflection which, they say, can only feel at home in the sphere of finitude. But just as there is a breadth which is emptiness, there is a de depth which is empty too, and we may have an extension of substance which overflows into finite multiplicity without the power of keeping the manifold together in the same way we may have an insubstantial intensity which keeping itself as mere force without actual expression is no better than superficiality. The force of mind is only as great as its expression, its depth only as deep as its power to expand and lose itself when spending and giving out its substance. Moreover, when this unreflective emotional knowledge makes a pretext of having immersed its own very self in the depths of absolute being, and of philosophizing in all holiness and truth, it hides from itself the fact that instead of devotion to God, it, rather by this contempt for all measurable precision and definiteness, simply confirms in its own case the fortuitous character of its content, and on the other endows God with its own caprice. When such minds commit themselves to the unrestrained ferment of sheer emotion, they think that, by putting it over self-consciousness and surrendering all understanding, they are thus God's beloved ones, to whom he gave his wisdom in sleep. This is the reason, too, that, in point of fact, what they do conceive and bring forth in sleep is dreams. For the rest it is not difficult to see that our epoch is a birth time and a period of transition. The spirit of the age has broken with the world as it has hitherto existed, and with the old ways of thinking, and is in the mind to let them all sink into the depths of the past and to set about its own transformation. It is indeed never at rest, but carried along the stream of progress ever onward. But it is here, in the case of the birth of a child, after a long period of nutrition and silence, the continuity of the gradual growth inside of quantitative change it is suddenly cut short by the first breath drawn. There is a break in the process, a qualitative change, and the child is born. In like manner the spirit of the time, growing slowly and quietly ripe for the new form it is to assume, loosens one fragment after another of the structures of its previous world. That it is tottering to its fall is indicated only by symptoms here and there frivolity and again ennui, which are spreading in, in the established order of things, the undefined foreboding of something unknown, all these are hints foretelling that there is something else approaching, gradual crumbling to pieces which did not alter the general look and aspect of the whole is interrupted by the sunrise, which in a flash and at a single stroke brings to view the form and structure of the new world. But this new world is perfectly realised, just as little as the newborn child, and it is essential to bear this in mind. It comes on the stage to begin in its immediacy, in its bare generality. The building is not finished when the foundation is laid. Just as little is the attainment of a general notion of a whole, the whole itself. 
when we want to see an oak with all its vigour of trunk its spreading branches and mass of foliage we are not satisfied to be shown an acorn instead in the same way science the crowning glory of a spiritual world is not found complete in its initial stages the beginning of the new spirit is the outcome of an extensive transformation of manifold forms of spiritual culture it is the reward which comes after a chequered and devious course of development and after much struggle and effort it is a whole which after running its course and laying bare all its contents returns again to itself it is the resultant abstract notion of the whole but the actual realization of this abstract whole is only found when these previous shapes and forms which are now reduced to ideal moments of the whole are developed anew again but developed and shaped within the new medium and within the meaning they have thereby acquired while the new world makes its first appearance merely in general outline merely as a whole lying concealed and hidden within a bare abstraction the wealth of the bygone life on the other hand is still consciously present in recollection consciousness misses in the new form the detailed expanse of content but still more the developed expression of form by which distinctions are definitely determined and arranged in their precise relations without this last feature science has no general intelligibility and has the appearance of being an esoteric possession of a few individuals an esoteric possession because in the first instance it is only the essential principle or notion of science only its inner nature that is to be found and a possession of a few individuals because at its first appearance its content is not elaborated and expanded in detail and thus its essence is turned into something particular only what is perfectly determinate in form is at the same time exoteric comprehensible capable of being learned and possessed by everybody intelligibility is the form in which science is offered to everybody and is the open road made plain for all to reach rational knowledge by our intelligence is the just demand of the mind which comes to science for intelligence understanding verstand is thinking pure activity of the self in general and what is intelligible verstandje is something from the first familiar and common to the scientific and unscientific mind alike enabling the unscientific mind to enter the domain of science science at its commencement when as yet it has neither got as far as detailed completeness nor perfection of form is exposed to blame on that account but to suppose this blame to attach to its essential nature would be as unjust as it is inadmissible not to be ready to recognize the demand for that further development in fuller detail in the contrast and opposition between these two aspects the initial and the developed stages of science seem to lie the critical knot which scientific culture at present struggles to loosen and about which it is not so very clear one side parades the wealth of its material and the intelligibility of ideas the other pours contempt at any rate on the latter and makes a parade of the immediate intuitive rationality and divine quality of its content although the first is reduced to science perhaps by the inner force of truth alone perhaps too by the noisy bluster of the other side and though having regard to the reason and nature of the case it did feel overborne yet it does not therefore feel satisfied as regards to these demands for greater development for those demands are just but still unfulfilled its silence is due only in part to the victory of the other side it is half due to that weariness and indifference which are usually the consequence when expectations are being constantly awakened by promises which are not followed up by performance the other side no doubt at times makes an easy enough matter of getting a vast expanse of content they haul it in a lot of material already familiar and arranged in order and since they are concerned more especially about what is exceptional strange and curious they seem all the more to be in possession of the rest which knowledge in its own way was finished and done with as well as to have control over what was unregulated and disorderly hence everything appears brought within the compass of the absolute idea which seems thus to be recognized in everything and to have succeeded in becoming a system in extenso of scientific knowledge but if we look more closely at this expanded system we find that it has not been reached by one and the same principle taking shape in diverse ways it is the shapeless repetition of one and the same idea which is applied in an external fashion to a different material the wearisome reiteration of it keeping up the semblance of diversity the idea which by itself is no doubt the truth really never gets any farther than just where it began as long as the development of it consists in nothing else than such repetition of the same formula 
if the knowing subject carries around everywhere the one inert abstract form taking it up in external fashion whatever material comes its way and dipping it into the element then this comes about as near to fulfilling what is wanted viz a self-origination of the wealth of detail and self-determining distinction of shapes and forms as any chance fantasies about the content in question it is rather a monotonous formalism which only comes by distinction in the matter it has to deal with because it is already prepared and well known this monotonousness and abstract universality are maintained to be the absolute this formalism insists that to be dissatisfied herewith argues an incapacity to grasp this standpoint of the absolute and keep a firm hold on it if it was once the case that the bare possibility of thinking something in some other fashion was sufficient to refute a given idea and the naked possibility the bare general thought possessed and passed for the entire substantive value of actual knowledge we find here similarly all the value ascribed to the general idea in this bare form without concrete realization and we here too see the style and method of speculative contemplation identified with the dissipating and resolving what is determinate and distinct or rather with hurling it down without more ado and without any justification into the abyss of vacuity to consider any specific fact as it is in the absolute consists here in nothing else than saying about that while it is now doubtless spoken of as something specific yet in the absolute in the abstract identity a equals a there is no such thing at all for everything there is all one to pit this single assertion that in the absolute all is one against the organized whole of determinate and complete knowledge or of knowledge which at least aims and demands complete development to give out its absolute as the night in which as we say all cows are black that is the very naivety of this vacuous knowledge the formalism which has been deprecated and despised by recent philosophy and which has arisen once more in philosophy itself will not disappear from science even though its inadequacy is known and felt till the knowledge of absolute reality has become quite clear as to what its own true nature consists in having in mind that the general idea of what is to be done if it precedes the attempt to carry it out facilitates the comprehension of this process it is worth while to indicate here that some rough idea of it with the hope at the same time that this will give the opportunity to set aside certain forms whose habitual presence is a hindrance in the way of speculative knowledge in my view a view which the developed exposition of the system itself can alone justify everything depends on grasping and expressing the ultimate truth not as substance but as subject as well at the same time we must note that concrete substantiality implicates and involves the universal or the immediacy of knowledge itself as well as the immediacy which is being or immediacy qua object for knowledge if the generation which heard god spoken of as the one substance was shocked and revolted by such a characterization of his nature the reason lay partly in the instinctive feeling that in such a conception self-consciousness was simply submerged and not preserved but partly again the opposite position which maintains thinking to be merely subjective thinking abstract universality as such as it is exactly the same bare uniformity is undifferentiated unmoved substantiality and even if in the third place thought combines with itself the being of substance and conceives immediacy or intuition Auschwang, as thinking it is still a question whether this intellectual intuition does not fall back into that inert abstract simplicity and exhibit and expound reality itself in an unreal manner the living substance further is that being which is truly subject or which is the same thing truly realized and actual solely in the process of positing itself or in mediating with its own self its transitions from one state or position to the opposite as subject it is pure and simple negativity and just on that account a process of splitting up what is simple and undifferentiated a process of duplicating and setting factors in opposition which process in turn is the negation of indifferent diversity and of the opposition of factors it entails true reality is merely this process of reinstating self-identity of reflecting in its own self in and from its other and is not an original and primal unity as such not an immediate unity as such it is the process of its own becoming the circle which presupposes its end or its purpose and has its end for its beginning it becomes concrete and actual only by being carried out and by being the end it involves the life of god and divine intelligence then can if we like be spoken of as love disporting with itself 
but this idea falls into edification and even sinks into insipidity if it lacks seriousness the suffering the patience and the labour of the negative per se the divine life is no doubt undisturbed identity and oneness with itself which feels no anxiety over otherness and estrangement and none over the surmounting to the estrangement but this per se is abstract generality where we abstract from its real nature which consists in its being objective to itself consciousness itself in its own account for sich zu sein and where consequently we neglect altogether the self-movement which is the formal character of its activity if the form is declared to correspond to the essence it is just for that reason a misunderstanding to suppose that knowledge can be content with the per se the essence but can do without the form that the absolute principle or absolute intuition makes the carrying out of the former or the development of the latter needless precisely because the form is as necessary to the essence as the essence is to it absolute reality must not be conceived of and expressed as an essence alone i e as an immediate substance or as pure self-intuition of the divine but as a form also and with the entire wealth of the developed form only then it is grasped and expressed as really actual the truth is the whole the whole however is merely the essential nature reaching its completeness through the process of its own development of the absolute it must be said that it is essentially a result only at the end it is what it is in very truth and just in that consists its nature which is to be actual subject or self-becoming self-development should it appear contradictory to say that the absolute has to be conceived essentially as a result a little consideration will set this appearance of contradiction in its true light the beginning the principle or the absolute as at first immediately expressed is merely the universal if we say all animals that does not pass for zoology for the same reason we see at once that the words absolute divine eternal and so on do not express what is implied in them and only mere words like these in point of fact express intuition as the immediate whatever is more than a word like that even the mere transition to a proposition is a form of mediation contains a process towards another state from which we must return once more it is this process of mediation however that is rejected with horror as if absolute knowledge were being surrendered when more is made of mediation than merely the assertion that it is nothing absolute and does not exist in the absolute this horrified rejection of mediation however arises as a fact from want of acquaintance with nature and with the nature of the absolute knowledge itself for mediating is nothing but self-identity working itself out through an active self-directed process or in other words it is reflection into self the aspect in which the ego for itself objective to itself it is pure negativity or reduced to its utmost abstraction the process of bare and simple becoming the ego or becoming in general this process of mediating is because of its being simple just immediacy coming to be and is immediacy itself we misconceive therefore the nature of reason if we exclude reflection or mediation from ultimate truth and do not take it to be a positive moment of the absolute it is reflection which constitutes the truth and final result and yet at the same time does away with the contrast between result and the process of arriving at it for this process is likewise simple and therefore not distinct from the form of truth which consists in appearing as simple in the result it is indeed just this restoration and return to simplicity while the embryo is certainly in itself implicitly a human being it is not so explicitly it does not take itself to be a human being for sich it is only the latter in the form of developed and cultivated reason which has made itself to be what it is implicitly its actual reality is first found here but this result arrived at is itself simple immediacy for it is self-conscious freedom which is at one with itself and has not set aside the opposition it involves and left it there it has made account with it and has become reconciled to it end of part one of the preface recording by morris and elsie bedfordshire Part 2 of the Preface of the Phenomenology of Mind, Volume 1, by George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, translated by James Black Bailey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Preface, Part 2. What has been said may also be expressed by saying that reason is purposive activity, extolling so-called nature at the expense of thought misunderstood, 
and more especially the rejection of external purposiveness, have brought the idea of purpose in general into disrepute. All the same, in this sense in which Aristotle too characterises nature as purposive activity, purpose is the immediate, the undisturbed, the unmoved, which is self-moving, as such it is subject. Its power of moving, taken abstractly, is its existence for itself, or pure negativity. The result is the same as the beginning solely because the beginning is purpose. Stated otherwise, what is actual and concrete is the same as its inner principle or notion simply because the immediate qua purpose contains within it the self or pure actuality. The realized purpose or concrete actuality is movement and process of development, but this very unrest is the self, and it is one and the same with that immediacy and simplicity characteristic of the beginning just for the reason that it is the result and has returned upon itself while this latter again is just the self and is the self self-referring and self-relating identity and simplicity when thinking of the absolute as subject men have made use of statements like god is the eternal or the moral order of the world or love etc in such propositions the ultimate truth is just barely stated to be subject but not set forth as the process of reflectively mediating itself within itself. In a proposition of that kind, we begin with the word God. By itself this is a meaningless sound, a mere name. The predicate says afterwards what it is, and gives content and meaning. The empty beginning becomes real knowledge only when we get to the end of the statement. So far as that goes, why not speak alone of the eternal, of the moral order of the world, etc.? or, like the ancients, of pure conceptions, such as being, the one, etc., i.e., of what gives the meaning without adding the meaningless sound at all. But this word just indicates that it is not being or essence or universal in general that is put forward, but something reflected into self, a subject. Yet at the same time this acceptance of the absolute as subject is merely anticipated, not really affirmed. The subject is taken to be a fixed point, and to it as their support the predicates are attached by a process falling within the individual knowing about it but not looked upon as belonging to the point of attachment itself only by such a process however could the content be presented as subject constituted as it is this process cannot belong to the subject but when that point of support is fixed to start with this process cannot be otherwise constituted it can only be external the anticipation that the absolute is subject is therefore not merely the realization of this conception it even makes realization impossible for it makes out the notion to be a static point while its actual reality is self-movement self-activity among the many consequences that follow from what has been said it is of importance to emphasize this that knowledge is only real and can only be set forth fully in the form of science in the form of system and further the so-called fundamental proposition or first principle of philosophy even if it, even if it is true is yet none the less false just because and in so far as it is merely a fundamental proposition merely a first principle it is for that reason easily refuted the refutation consists in bringing out its defective character and it is defective because it is merely universal merely a principle the beginning if the refutation is complete and thorough, it is derived and developed from the nature of the principle itself, and not accomplished by bringing in from elsewhere other counter-assurances and chance fancies. It would be strictly the development of the principle, and thus the completion of its deficiency, were it not that it misunderstands its own purport by taking account solely of the negative aspect of what it seeks to do, and is not conscious of the positive character of the process and result. The really positive working out of the beginning is at the same time just as much the very reverse it is a negative attitude towards the principle we start from negative that is to say of its one-sided form which consists in being primarily immediate mere purpose it may therefore be regarded as a refutation of what constitutes the basis of the system but more correctly it should be looked as a demonstration that the basis or the principle of the system is in point of fact merely its beginning that truth is only realized in this form of system that substance is essentially subject is expressed in the idea which represents the absolute as spirit 
Geist, the grandest conception of all, and the one which is due to modern times and its religion. Spirit is the only reality. It is the inner being of the world, that which essentially is, and is per se. It assumes objective determinate form, and enters into relations with itself. It is externality, otherness, and exists for itself. Yet in this determination, and in this otherness, it is still one with itself. It is self-contained and self-complete in itself, and for itself at once. This self-containedness, however, is first something known by us. It is implicit in its nature, and sich. It is substance spiritual. It has to become self-contained for itself, on its own account. It must get knowledge of spirit, and it must be conscious of itself as spirit. As spirit. This means it must be presented to itself as an object, but at the same time, straight away, annul and transcend this objective form. It must be its own subject, in which it finds itself reflected. So far as its spiritual content is produced by its own activity, it is only we, the thinkers, who know spirit to be for itself, to be objective to itself. But in so far as spirit knows itself to be for itself, then this self-production, the pure notion, is the sphere and element in which its objectification takes effect, and where it gets existential form. In this way it is existence aware of itself as an object in which its own self is reflected. Mind, which thus developed knows itself to be mind, is science. Science is its relation and the kingdom it sets up for itself in its own native element. The self having knowledge purely of itself, in the absolute antithesis of itself, this pure ether as such is the very soil where science flourishes, is knowledge in universal form. The beginning of philosophy presupposes or demands from consciousness that it should feel at home in this element, but this element only attains its perfect meaning and acquires transparency through the process of gradually developing it. It is pure spirituality as the universal which assumes the shape of simple immediacy, and this simple immediate element existing as such is the soil of science is thinking and can be only in mind because this medium this immediacy of mind is the mind's substantial nature in general it is the transfigured essence reflection which itself is simple which is aware of itself as immediacy it is being which is reflection into itself science on its side requires the individual self-consciousness to have risen into this high ether in order to be able to live with science and in science, and really to feel alive there. Conversely, the individual has the right to demand that science shall hold the ladder to help him get as far as this position, shall show him that he has himself this ground to stand on. His right rests on absolute independence, which he knows he possesses in every type and phase of knowledge, for in every phase, whether recognised by science or not, and whatever be the content, his right as an individual is the absolute and final form, i.e. he is the immediate certainty of self, and thereby is unconditioned being, were this expression preferred. If the position taken up by consciousness, that of knowing about objective things as opposed to itself, and about itself as opposed to them, is held by science to be the very opposite of this position, if, when in knowing it keeps within itself, and never gets beyond itself, science holds the state to be rather the loss of mind altogether. On the other hand, the element in which science consists is looked at by consciousness as a remote and distant region, in which the consciousness no longer in possession of itself. Each of these two sides takes the other to be the perversion of the truth, for the naive consciousness, to give itself up completely and straight away to science, is to make an attempt induced by some unknown influence and all at once to walk on its head. The compulsion to take up this attitude and to move about in this position is a constraining force it is urged to fall in with, without ever being prepared for it, and with no apparent necessity for doing so. Let science be, per se, what it likes. In its relation to naive, immediate self-conscious life it, it presents the appearance of being a reversal of the latter. Or again, because naive self-consciousness finds the principle of reality in the certainty for itself, science bears the character of unreality, since consciousness for itself is a state quite outside science. Science has, for that reason, to combine that other element of self-certainty with its own, or rather to show that the other element belongs to itself and how it does so. 
when devoid of that sort of reality science is merely the content of mind qua something implicit or potential and sich purpose which at the start is no more than something internal not spirit but first merely spiritual substance this implicit moment and sich is to find external expression and become an objective in its own account this means nothing else than that its moment has to establish self-consciousness as one with itself it is this process by which science in general comes about this gradual development of knowing that is set forth here in the phenomenology of mind knowing as it is found at the start mind in its immediate primitive stages without the essential nature of mind is sense consciousness to get the length of genuine knowledge or produce the element where science is found the pure conception of science itself a long and laborious journey must be undertaken this process towards science as regards the content it will bring to light and the forms it will assume in the course of its progress will not be what is primarily imagined by leading the scientific consciousness up to the level of science it will be something different too from establishing and laying the foundation of science and anyway something else than the sort of ecstatic enthusiasm which starts straight off with the absolute knowledge as if shot out of a pistol and makes short work of other points of view simply by explaining that it is to take no notice of them the task of conducting the individual mind from its unscientific standpoint to that of science has to be taken in its general sense we had to contemplate the formative development bildung of the universal or general individual or self-conscious spirit as to the relation between these two the particular and the general individual every moment as it gains concrete form and its own proper shape and appearance finds a place in the life of the universal individual the particular individual is incomplete mind a concrete shape in whose existence taken as a whole one determinate characteristic predominates while the others are found only in a blurred outline in this mind which stands higher than another the lower concrete form of existence has sunk into an obscure moment what was once a substantial objective fact die sacht selbst is now only a single trace its definite shape has been veiled and become simply a piece of shading the individual whose substance is mind at the higher level passes through these past forms much the same way that one who takes up higher stance goes through the preparatory forms of knowledge which he has long made his own in order to call up their content before him he brings back the recollection of them without stopping to fix his interest upon them the particular individual so far as content is concerned has also to go through the stages through which the general mind has passed but as shapes once assumed by mind now laid aside as stages of a road which has been worked over and levelled out hence it is that in the case of various kinds of knowledge we find that what in former days occupied the energies of men of mature mental ability sinks to the level of information exercise and even pastimes for children and in these educational processes we can see the history of the world's culture delineated by a faint outline this bygone mode of existence has already become an acquired possession of the general mind which constitutes the substance of the individual and by thus appearing externally to him furnishes his inorganic nature in this respect culture or development of mind bildung regarded from the side of the individual consists in this acquiring what lies at hand ready for him in making its inorganic nature organic to himself and in taking possession of it for himself looked at however from the side of universal mind qua general spiritual substance culture means nothing else than that this substance gives itself its own self-consciousness brings about its own inherent process and its own reflection into self science lays before us the morphogenic process of this cultural development in all its detailed fullness and necessity and at the same time shows it to be something that has already sunk into the mind as a moment of its being and become a possession of mind the goal to be reached is the mind's insight into what knowing is impatience asks for the impossible wants to reach the goal without the means of getting there the length of the journey has to be borne with for every moment is necessary and again we must halt at every stage for each is itself complete individual form and is fully and finally considered only in so far as it has determinate character is taken and is dealt with as a rounded and concrete whole or only as in so far as the whole is looked at 
in the light of the special and peculiar character which, which this determination gives it. Because the substance of the individual mind, nay more because the individual mind at work with the world, Weltgeist, has had the patience to go through these forms in the long stretch of time's extent, and take upon itself the prodigious labour of the world's history, where it bodied forth in each form, in the entire content of itself, which each is capable of grasping, and because by nothing less could that all-pervading mind ever manage to become conscious of what it's, it itself is, for that reason the individual mind, in the nature of the case, cannot expect by less toil to grasp what its own substance contains. All the same, its task has meanwhile been made much lighter, because this has historically been implicitly, an sich, accomplished, and the content is one where reality has already given place to spiritual possibilities, where immediacy has been overcome and brought under the control of reflection, the various forms and shapes having been already reduced to their intellectual abbreviations, to determinations of thought, pure and simple. Gedanken bei Stimmung being now a thought, this content is the possession of the substance of mind. Existence has no more to be changed into the form that it is inherent and implicit, anschens, but only the implicit, no longer merely something primitive nor lying hidden within existence, but already present as a recollection, into the form of what is explicit, of what is objective to self, verschens. We have to state more exactly the way this is done. At the point at which we here take up this movement, we are spared, in connection with the whole, the process of cancelling and transcending the stage of mere existence. This process has already taken place. What is still to be done, and needs a higher kind of transformation, is to transcend the forms as ideally as presented and made familiar to our minds. By that previous negative process, existence having been withdrawn into the mind's substance, is, in the first instance, transferred into the life of self only in an immediate way. The possession of self has thereby acquired has still the same character of uncomprehended immediacy, of passive indifference, which existence itself had. Existence has, in this way, merely passed into the form of ideal presentation. At the same time, by so doing, it is something familiar to us, something well known, something which the existent mind has finished and done with, and hence takes no more to do with and no further interest in. When the activity that is done with the existent is merely the process of a particular mind, of mind which is not comprehending itself. On the other hand, knowledge is directed against this ideal presentation which has hereby arisen against this being familiar and well known. It is an action of universal mind, the concern of thought. What we are familiar with is not intelligently known, just for the reason that it is familiar. When engaged in the process of knowing, it is the commonest form of self-deception, and a deception of other people as well, to assume something to be familiar and give assent to it on that very account. Knowledge of that sort, with all its talk, never gets from the spot, but has no idea that this is the case. Subject and object, and so on, God, nature, understanding, sensibility, etc., are uncritically presupposed as familiar and something significant, and become fixed points from which to start and from which to return. The process of knowing flits between these secure point, and in consequence goes on merely along the surface. Apprehending and demonstrating consistent similarity, seeing whether everyone finds what is said corresponding to his idea too, whether it is familiar and seems to him so and so or so and so not. Analysis of an idea as it used to be carried out did anyway consist in nothing else than doing away with the character of familiarity. To break up an idea into its ultimate elements means returning upon its moments which at least do not have the form of the idea as picked up, but are the immediate property of the self. Doubtless the analysis only arrives at thoughts which are themselves known elements, fixed inert determinations. But what is thus broken up into parts, this unreal entity, is itself an essential moment. For just because the concrete fact is self-divided and turns into unreality, it is something self-moving, self-active. The action of separating the elements is the exercise of the force of understanding, the most astonishing and greatest of all powers, or rather the absolute power. The circle which is self-enclosed and at rest, and being a substance holds its own moments, is an immediate condition, the immediate 
continuous relation of elements with their unity, and hence arouses no sense of wonderment. But an accident as such, when cut loose from its containing circumference, that what is bound and held by something else, and actual only by being connected with it, should get an existence all its own, gain freedom and independence in its own account, this is the portentous power of the negative. It is the energy of thought of pure ego. Death, as what we might call that unreality, is the most terrible thing, and to keep hold fast what is dead demands the greatest force of all. Beauty, powerless and helpless, hates understanding, because the latter extracts from it what it cannot perform. But the life of mind is not one that shuns death and keeps clear of destruction. It endures its death, and in death maintains its being. It only wins it to its truth when it finds itself in utter desolation. It is the mighty power, not by being a positive which turns away from the negative, as when we say something there is nothing or it is false, and being then done with it pass off to something else. On the contrary, mind is this power only by looking at the negative in the face and dwelling with it. This dwelling besides it is the ma magic power that converts the negative into being. That power is just what we spoke of above a subject, which by giving determinateness a place in substance cancels abstract immediacy, i.e. immediacy which merely is, and by so doing becomes its true substance, becomes being or immediacy, that does not have mediation outside it, but is this mediation itself. This process of making what is objectively presented a possession of pure self-consciousness, of raising it to the level of universality in general, is merely one aspect of mental development. Spiritual evolution is not yet completed. The manner of study in ancient times is distinct from that of the modern world, in that the former consisted of the cultivation and perfecting of the natural mind. Testing life carefully at all points, philosophizing about everything that it came across, the former created an experience permeated through and through by universals. In modern times, however, an individual finds the abstract form ready-made. In straining to grasp and make it its, his own, he rather strives to bring forward the inner meaning alone without any process of mediation. The production of the universal is abridged instead of the universal arising out of the manifold detail of concrete existence. Hence nowadays the task before us is to consider, not so much in getting the individual clear of the level of sensuous immediacy and making him a substance that thinks and is grasped in terms of thought, but rather the very opposite. It consists in actualizing the universal and giving its spiritual vitality by the process of breaking down and suspending fixed and determinate thoughts. But it is much more difficult to make fixed and definite thoughts fuse with one another and form a continuous whole than to bring sensuous existence into this state. The reason lies in what was said before. Thought determinations get their substance and their elements of their existence from the ego, the power of negative or pure reality, while determination of sense finds in impotent abstract immediacy in mere beings in such. Thoughts become fluent and interfuse when thinking pure and simple. This inner immediacy knows itself as a moment when pure certainty of self abstracts from itself. It does not abstract in the sense of getting away from itself and setting itself on one side, but of surrendering the fixed quality of its self-affirmation and giving up both the fixity of the purely concrete, which is the ego as contrasted with the variety of its content, and the fixity of all those distinctions, the various thought functions, principles, etc., which are present in the element of pure thought and share that absoluteness in the ego. In virtue of this process, pure thoughts become notions and conceptions, and are there what they are in truth, self-moving conjunctions, circles, what their substance consists of, are spiritual entities. This movement of the spiritual entities constitutes the nature of the scientific procedure in general. Looked at as the concatenation of their content, this movement is the necessitated development and expansion of that content into an organic systematic whole. By this movement too, the road which leads to the notion of knowledge becomes itself likewise a necessary and complete involving process, verdon. This preparatory stage thus ceases to consist in casual philosophical reflections, referring to objects here and there, to processes and thoughts of the undeveloped mind, as chance may direct, and it does not try to establish the truth by miscellaneous rationalizations, inferences and consequences drawn from circumscribed thoughts. The road to science by the very movement of the notion itself, 
will compass the entire objective world of conscious life and rational necessity further a systematic exposition like this constitutes the first part of science because the positive existence of mind qua primary and ultimate is nothing but the immediate aspect of mind the beginning the beginning but not yet its return to itself the characteristic feature distinguishing this part of science phenomenology from others is that element of positive immediate experience the mention of this distinction leads us to discuss certain established ideas that usually come to notice in this connection the mind's immediate existence conscious life has two aspects cognition and objectivity which is opposed to or negative of the subject function of knowing since it is the medium of consciousness that mind is developed and brings out its various moments this opposition between the factors of conscious life is found at each stage of in the evolution of mind and all the various moments appear as modes or forms gestalten of consciousness the scientific statement of the course of this development is a science of experience through which the consciousness passes the substance and its processor considers the object of consciousness consciousness is known and comprehends nothing but what falls within experience for what is found in experience is merely spiritual substance and moreover object of itself mind however becomes object for it consists in the process of becoming another to itself i.e. an object for its own self and in transcending in this otherness and experience is called this very process by which the element that is immediate unexperienced i.e. abstract whether it be in the form of sense or of a bare thought externalizes itself and then comes back to itself from this state of estrangement and so by doing at length is set forth in its concrete nature and real truth and becomes too a possession of consciousness the dissimilarity which obtains in consciousness between the ego and the substance constituting its object is the inner distinction the factor of negativity in general we may regard it as the defect of both opposites but it is their very soul their moving spirit it was on this account that certain thinkers long ago took the void to be the principle of movement and when they conceived the moving principle to be the negative element though they had not yet thought of it as self while this negative factor appears in the first instance as a dissimilarity an inequality between ego and object it is just as much the inequality of the substance with itself what seems to take place outside it to be an actively directed against it is its own doing its own activity and substance shows that it is in reality subject when it has brought out the completely mind it has made its existence adequate to and one with its essential nature mind is object to itself just as it is and the abstract element of immediacy of the separation between knowing and the truth is overcome being is entirely mediated it is a substantial contact it is likewise directly the possession of the ego it has the character of self is notion with the attainment of this the phenomenology of mind concludes what mind prepares for itself by argument of the phenomenology is the element of true knowledge it is this element the moments of mind that are now set out in the form of thought pure and simple which knows its object to be itself they no longer involve the opposition between being and knowing they remain within the undivided simplicity of knowing function they are truth in the form of truth and their diversity is merely diversity of the content of truth the process by which they are developed in to an organically connected whole is logic and speculative philosophy now because the systematic statement of the mind's experience embraces merely its way of appearing it may as well seem that the advance from that to the science of ultimate truth in the form of truth is merely negative and we might readily be content to dispense with the negative process as something altogether false and might ask to be taken straight to the truth at once why meddle with what is false at all the point formally raised that we should have begun with science at once may be answered here by considering the character of negativity in general regarded as something false the usual ideas on this subject particularly obstruct the approach to truth the consideration at this point will give us an opportunity to speak about the mathematical knowledge the unphilosophical mind looks upon as the ideal which philosophy ought to try to attain but is so far striven to in vain to reach truth and falsehood as commonly understood belong to these sharply defined areas which claim a completely fixed nature of their own one standing in solid isolation on this side the other on that without any community between them against this view it must be pointed out that truth is not like a stamped coin that is issued ready from the mint and so can be taken up and used 
nor again is there something false any more than there is something evil evil and falsehood are not so bad as the devil for in the form of the devil they get the length of being particular subjects qua false and evil they are merely individuals although they have a nature of their own with reference to one another falsity that is what we're dealing with here would be otherness the negative aspect of the substance which substance qua content of knowledge is truth but the substance is itself essentially the negative element partly as involving distinction and determination of content partly as being a process of distinguishing pure and simple i e as being self and knowledge in general doubtless we can know in a way in which is false to know something falsely means that knowledge is not adequate to is not on equal terms with its substance yet this very dissimilarity in the process is distinction in general the essential moment is knowing it is in fact out of this active distinction that its harmonious unity arises and that this identity when arrived at is truth it is not truth in a sense which would involve the rejection of the discordance the diversity like dross from pure metal nor again does truth remain detached from diversity like a finished article from the instrument that shapes it difference itself continues to be an immediate element within truth as such in the form of the principle of negation in the form of the activity of self all the same we cannot for that reason say that falsehood is a moment or forms even a constituent part of truth that quote, in every case of falsity there is something true unquote, is an expression in which they are taken to be like oil and water which do not mix and are merely united externally just in the interest of their real meaning precisely because we want to designate the aspect or moment of complete otherness the terms true and false must no longer be used where their otherness has been cancelled and superseded just as the expressions quote, unity of subject and object unquote, of quote, finite and infinite of quote, being and thought unquote, etc are absurd if the subject and object etc are taken to mean what they are outside their unity and thus the unity means to be what its very expression conveys in the same way falsehood is not qua false any longer a moment of truth dogmatism as a way of thinking whether in ordinary knowledge or in the study of philosophy is nothing else but the view that truth consists in a proposition which is a fixed and final result or again which is directly known to questions like when was caesar born or how many feet has a furlong etc a straight answer it ought to be given just as it is absolutely true to say the square of the hypotenuse is equal to the sum of the square on the other two sides of a right angled triangle but the nature of a so-called truth of that sort is different from the nature of philosophical truth end of the preface part two recording by morris in Isles, bedfordshire